We are moving to the next talk. It's with great pleasure I would like to introduce uh, Marzia Gassemi. She's a, a visiting re researcher with Google and a postdoctoral fellow in the clinical decision making group at MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Uh, she will join the University of Toronto as a faculty member as an assistant professor in computer science and medicine in fall 2018, and she will be affiliated with the Vector Institute. She will be talking about that <laughs> phenomics is the new genomics. Okay. Hi, everyone. I think John Brownstein gave me his cold, so I, uh, I'm going to also sound like I'm dying when I'm uh, speaking up here. So uh, my name is Marzia, and I'm going to tell you today why I believe that phenotype is the new genotype. Uh, I am currently at Verily. I'm a visiting researcher, and I'm doing a, a part-time postdoc with my advisor. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm doing these things now, and I very shortly will move to the University of Toronto uh, this, this coming fall. I'm actually interviewing graduate students right now, which is very stressful um, for all the graduate students in the, in the crowd. Faculty hurt, too. Um, so I, I should say, you know, one of the, the funny things about doing interviews at the University of Toronto, uh, I laughed at Matt Mike's uh, talk when he was uh, talking about leaving the White House is everybody uh, in Toronto, everybody in Canada was like, oh, you know, you're American. Do you mind moving to Canada? And I said, well, I mean, I don't know, you know, how are things here? And they were like, we have political drama too. <laughs> just, just last week, Justin Trudeau elbowed somebody in Parliament. <laughs> And but they said it with like real gravitas, like you know they really believed it, like it was a scandal. Um, so I, <laughs> so I'm moving to Toronto. Uh, when I'm there, I'm going to be in the Faculty of Computer Science and Medicine. Um, I'm hoping to focus on more machine learning in healthcare for healthcare uh, and bridging that gap. Today I'm going to talk to you mostly about work I completed during my PhD and a little bit about some of the work that I'm doing at Verily. Uh, so why do you need phenotyping for healthcare? Why should we even be working in healthcare? There's the easy sell, which is we're good people and improving health means you're improving lives, so we want to do that. But one of the things I really noticed over the course of my PhD is you would see a patient come into the ICU when I was sitting at rounds with my clinical collaborators, and the same patient would get recommendations for different treatments, even in the same hospital, if, even if it was just two different clinicians. And I said, well, why is that the case? And they said, well, we really don't have a great system right now, unless you're talking about personal experience, for phenotyping. And phenotyping really requires targeting and evidence. And you guys might all be saying, ha-ha, don't we have evidence? Isn't, doesn't that already exist? So pop quiz, because I'm standing between you guys and lunch. Um, how, and I won't move on until somebody answers. How many treatments do you guys think, and this is a clinical citation, I promise no computer science paper will be cited here, um, are based on our gold standard, right? Randomized controlled trials, that's what we base our, our treatments on. So if you went into an ICU and you measured how many of these things are actually based on an RCT, how many do you think that would be? Any guesses? We want that to be high, right? It's not. It's pretty low. Oh, 10 to 20 percent is the number that's cited in the study, but it could be higher. So right now, when you go into an ICU, very few of the things that a doctor could do to you are based on a randomized control trial. And this is not because of malintent, right? It's not like a doctor is trying to be malicious. It's because randomized control trials are really expensive and they're hard to do. Okay, let's take a situation where we do have randomized control trials, right? So the treatment for asthmatics is actually based on randomized control trials. So they took a bunch of asthmatics and then they gave them different treatments. And now there's a set of recommendations for how you should treat asthmatics based on those randomized control trials. But asthma is pretty common, right? Lots of people have asthma. So how many asthmatics do you guys think would have qualified for the trials that were used to decide how to treat them? It's not that many. It's, it's pretty few. 
And again, this is, this is not malintent, right? This is not maliciousness. These RCTs have structured biases because when you're trying to determine whether a treatment is working, you would ideally like to be able to just look at somebody who only has that condition and say, aha, in this very simple case, we know this, this medication works. But that's not helpful for the larger population. And so that's why phenotyping is very important. So why am I talking to you about phenotyping now? It's because we have a lot more data. So you've heard all morning about how we have new data available. And uh, you know, recently, this has really just exploded. So 80% of American hospitals, over 60% of Canadian practitioners. And so the question is, can we not just repeatedly do studies where we're testing one signal at a time? Can we try to use machine learning to derive insight from health data writ large in all the ways that you've heard about today? So I, I'm going to tell you now that despite the gorgeous visuals that Matt showed us, this is hard. So this data is not gathered to answer your question. Most healthcare data is found. If, if it was gathered to answer your question, that's an RCT, right? And it has all the issues that we talked about previously. So in healthcare data that we're working with, it's often created as a byproduct of providing care. And when I'm providing care, it's not really my concern that your data is so pretty or so clean. And so a lot of these things that are not so hard in other fields that machine learning focuses on are really hard here. So the data is very heterogeneous. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's sampled in different ways. You can have notes that are recorded whenever the nurse has an observation. You can have signals that are recorded every hour. You can have labs that are ordered every other day. For each of these different sampling rates, you have to deal with all the different data types, right? Is it text? Is it signal? Is it binary? What, is it billing information, which is categorical? And these are all evolving on vastly different timescales. It might make a lot of sense for one signal to change very rapidly, but others to be stable, uh, stable or steady for days. So if you're dealing with that kind of heterogeneity, one big issue is sparsity. So it, you know, in machine learning, often we have uh, special tools to deal with sparsity. But uh, sparsity, I think, in other domains is nowhere near what we see here. So in clinical data, it's possible that you don't see something because it was not measured. Maybe you're in the ICU and some sort of sensor fell off, and so it just it wasn't measured. The nurse was doing something more important, so she didn't rush over to put the sensor back on. It could be that it was measured, but just never reported, right? So maybe I did a lab test, and I indicated in the record that a lab test was done, but I never put in what the value that I got back was. Maybe it is both measured uh, and reported, but there's just no follow-up. So I can know that you need a medication and give it to you. That's in your record. I don't know sometimes if you filled that. I don't know if you filled it when you took it. I don't know when you took it, how regularly you took it. And these are all things that are really challenging to deal with when you're modeling something. And so, as you can imagine, there's a ton of uncertainty, right? In a lot of fields, the thing that we're really certain about is our label, right? So like if it's a chair, I'm pretty sure it's a chair unless it was designed by Frank Gehry. And then we could probably all still agree it was meant to be a chair. Um, but in this case, we don't even know if a label is true. So for example, if you have the diagnostic code for uh, diabetes in your billing record, it could be there at that time because number one, you've been diabetic for a very long time and I just found it. It could be in there because I want to test you for diabetes and the only way to get your insurance to pay is to have that billing code in your record. Or it could be there because I just discovered that you have diabetes, you've just developed it. It could be any of those things. And there's very little good way to tell. There's also a lot of bias. Often you are seeing a patient more when they are very ill, right? Why else would I be seeing them? We don't have this even sampling of people, and for any person, we don't have an even sampling of their record. And, you know, I think the hardest thing is also context here. Context matters so much. Even if we had great labels, even if we had better sampling, uh, to say that a patient has improved in one setting can mean that they're no longer on death's door. To say that a patient has improved in another setting could mean that they are maintaining their blood glucose better. 
And so these are all things that we have to contend with in machine learning for health that are not as challenging in vision or speech recognition or natural language processing, which by the way, we are all experts in. Everybody in this room is an expert on vision or natural language or speech. We can all label those things. And it's very challenging to get even two experts, two doctors, to agree on these things in healthcare. So health also requires domain knowledge, right? I don't want to pretend that machine learning has all of these fancy tools and we don't need to speak with clinicians. Um, I was actually, uh, when I was doing job interviews, I had a computer scientist uh, who's in a different field say, oh, you do machine learning, it's so magical. So you just take the healthcare data and apply the machine learning and you get insight. I said, no, that's not what happens. And in fact, that's really terrifying because learning out of the box without understanding is really dangerous in general and particularly problematic in healthcare. There was a great paper by Rich Caruana at KDD a few years ago where he took a hospital data set and he applied a learning algorithm to it and it learned that if you have asthma, you are at a lower risk of dying from pneumonia. All the clinicians in the audience should be cringing because that's clearly not true. The issue is in the training data that is true. But it's true because if you have asthma and you go to the hospital, the doctors say, aha, you have asthma, let's treat this person more aggressively. And so it was true in the training data that there were fewer deaths of pneumonia. That doesn't mean that we should learn the rule, has asthma, lower risk of pneumonia. That would be really bad. But that is, in fact, one of the rules that was learned. So this can be tricky. So I'm going to argue with you today that representation is really a key for healthcare. I think that there are three things that I'll try to uh, consistently bring up, which are the representation should be useful abstractions for the data that they are modeling. They should disentangle underlying factors. So if you're observing different signals, heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate, temperature, you would like to maybe learn a latent state. And conditioned on knowledge of that latent state, you'd like to know what you think is probable for uh, this patient to look like. We'd like to enable super, semi-supervised learning. So we believe that if something explains the underlying data, it should be good for modeling different outcomes, right? And so an analogy here is when you train a deep neural network, the representations that you learn along the way for modeling the data, like edges or curves or uh, gradients of light, those things are all useful for predicting objects. And finally, we'd really like to allow shared factors across many learning tasks. So in speech recognition, there are these features called mel frequency coefficients, or MFCCs. And they are useful both for identifying who is speaking, me or somebody else, and what is being said. Did I say cat or dog? And uh, as a, if you're a non-machine learning person, that is very unintuitive. It is completely unintuitive that you should be able to have features that work very well for both of those tasks. So uh, here are the things that I think are uh, cool opportunities for machine learning and clinical applications. Early prediction of actionable inpatient ICU interventions, good representations for post-discharge outcome prediction, and evidence-based feedback in wearable outpatient devices. I see some very hungry looking faces, and so I promise I will only go through one example for each of these, and it'll be reasonably brief. So first, for early prediction of actionable inpatient ICU interventions. So there is a data set that exists that I'd like to uh, push a little bit because it is the only one like it so far. It is the MIMIC ICU data. So it was collected from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. That's Leo Celli, who's one of my clinical collaborators. Uh, he's a great guy. And this data set, which any academic can go download right now, use for any of their algorithms, is tracking all of the patients in the ICUs there. So you can get their signals, the numerical data, that's labs and vitals. You can get narrative information, some of the traditional EMR information. In this study, we focused mostly on the numerical information. So that's labs and vitals. So here's an example task of something you might want to do as a clinician. You might want to do early prediction of vasopressors. So a vasopressor is just a drug. It's a drug that raises your blood pressure. It's commonly used in the ICU. 
But like any drug, there are side effects. So we'd like to be able to predict when somebody needs it. And maybe we can give them something less aggressive, like fluids, if we can do it early enough. We're going to assume that the real clinical data is good, that the clinicians are doing the right thing most of the time. And we're going to predict these upcoming interventions based on what we see. So we had many different tasks that we set up. Um, I'm going to focus on the harder one, which is predicting earlier than we think the clinician might have known. So that's five to 10 hours. So we observe a bunch of physiological signals. And now every hour, we want to predict the onset of the drug before the doctor. And the way that you do this, uh, or the way that we did this in our paper, was we use the switching state autoregressive model. So if you know this, uh, if this is your field, um, this will seem reasonably natural to you. If this is not your field, that's fine. Because the only thing that you need to know here is that a patient can now be a sequence of latent states, and that every latent state can emit a distribution of values. And the important thing for how we did modeling here is we tried to allow for the states to be learned in an unsupervised way, right? We didn't tell uh, the learning algorithm, uh, find the features that will predict this outcome of needing a vasopressor. It is a generative model that's trying to explain as much variation in the underlying data as possible. Once you've learned those latent states in an unsupervised way, unsupervised for some value, I'll get shot later by some, some people. Um, then you can feed them into a supervised learning algorithm and see how good they are. So we're gonna learn the representation in an unsupervised generative modeling way, and then we're going to evaluate them in a supervised setting to see how good they are as compared to the raw data. And it turns out they're pretty good. So the latent representations add predictive power on their own, they do about as well as the raw data. So the raw data gives you an AUC of 0.83, higher is better. The latent states, which are far fewer, there's only five, do about as well. And then when you concatenate them, they do strictly better. That's great. Um, and this is really cool because if you have new state-of-the-art prediction, then that means that you can treat people early or maybe give them less aggressive interventions. So, Another way that you can look at these latent states is you can push them together and say, in a regularized learning framework where I try to force some of these things to go to zero, to not be informative, which ones win? And you can see there are some raw values that do win, right? So body mass index or your incoming acuity score are very predictive of whether you'll need a vasopressor sometime in the future, but our latent states are always significant, and there's a whole host of raw values that aren't. And then the nice thing about generative models is that there's post hoc interpretability. So we could go back to a clinician and say, here is the state that was associated with vasopressor onset. What do you guys notice? And they can say, well, I noticed that it has low average values of blood oxygenation and bicarbonate, and that it also has the highest lactate levels of any state. And that's really cool because then we can try to brainstorm hypotheses for why this could be true and find other things in the clinical literature to back up our assumptions. And so uh, work like this, I think, is really uh, powerful, especially when done in collaboration with clinicians. So uh, we saw some similar trends in the other predictive tasks. So remember the others that I wasn't going to focus on, we applied it to the same thing because we want our representation to be good at many things. And uh, so it works. It's a useful abstraction in multiple tasks. But then we noticed that the AUC was kind of low in the weaning task, which I was unhappy about. And uh, we had gone back to our clinical collaborator and said, hey, do you think that we need to do some more complex modeling? And he said, well, maybe you should look at where you got this wrong. Because patients can be left on interventions for longer than they need, right? And so it's possible that your algorithm, since it's training over many patients who all have different doctors, is recognizing that a patient needs to be weaned. And then that patient is not weaned immediately. They're not taken off the drug immediately. And so you're saying you got it wrong. And that's certainly not always the case. And there's no way to know for sure if a patient really needed to be on the drug for the entire time. But we did find uh, several examples where we feel like we could have weaned early, 
And so this is valuable information. So here's an example of a 62-year-old male with uh, cardiac catheterization. And you can see uh, when our probability that this patient should be weaned gets higher, you can have notes from the clinical staff that sort of correspond to that. So initially, the patient has low central venous pressure, rising hematocrit, and the nurse says they need to continue the presser, keep them on it. When the probability of being weaned gets lower, in fact, the nurse says, they have increased their need for the presser. And then as we start to say, this patient really looks like they could be weaned, the nurse says, you should attempt to wean them off this today. The nurse then says, you really should wean them, right? This patient wasn't weaned until 45, 46 hours, right, on the plot. But you can see that's 20 hours later than the nurse thought they could be weaned and also than we sort of thought they could be weaned too. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity here for collaborating with clinical staff and trying to understand why decisions get made and if we can be helpful. So uh, the next thing I'm going to tell you about is good representations for post-discharge uh, outcomes. So I just spent some time talking to you about uh, actions, right? You know, we want to treat somebody. This is something different. This is saying what will happen to a patient eventually long term. So we really want to predict patient acuity. How severely ill is a person based on their clinical progress notes? So acuity is, is very important. I hear doctors talk about it all the time. They'll say, well, I think this patient is more severely ill than this patient. But there's no universal definition of it. Often proxies are used. So in this work, we used mortality as a proxy for acuity. And prior state of the art here has really focused on feature engineering in labs and vitals for the target population. So you'll say, I want to look at a set of patients uh, who have a certain condition, and I want to see if I can use their labs and their vitals, uh, maybe think of some features that make sense and predict something important. But if you sit in an ICU, you really notice that clinicians rely on their notes. Like very infrequently have I seen them flip back through the record of the vitals or the labs. Really, they're looking at their notes. So why don't we use the notes? Well, we don't use them because they look like that. Um, they're very messy. There are lots of misspellings. There's lots of acronyms. Context really matters in the note. And so uh, previous to this work, there hadn't been a lot of work in using them. But we really wanted to try modeling them. And so here's the core representation idea. So similar to before, so same thing. We want to learn the representation without the label of the thing we're trying to predict. We don't want to say, learn the best topics for predicting mortality. We want to say, learn the best topics from these notes that explain most of the underlying data. So you can think about that as an unsupervised learning step. So we model patients as an aggregated set of their notes, and then notes are just a distribution over topics. If you do natural language processing, this is just a topic model or LDA over time. And once you have these topics learned, you can evaluate how good the topics are both by looking at them in a generative way, right? So just like in the previous case, we looked at the emission, what kind of values were coming out of the state. We can look at what words come out of the topic, see if they make sense. And then we can also evaluate them in a supervised way. We can see if they work to help predict mortality in this case. So first, let's see if the topics look reasonable. So there is a correlation between the average topic representation and mortality. So if you take patients and look at how enriched their record is for specific topics, some of the topics experience mortality a lot more often. And so here you can see their top 10 words look like respiratory failure. And then for some of the topics where you see uh, much less mortality, you'll see words that seem to correspond to cardiovascular surgery. So I thought this was a bug when, when I first did this, and it's, it's actually not. So, Cardiovascular patients often have the best recovery rates, the lowest mortality rates, and it's because unless you are in um, really severe danger of dying immediately, the cardiovascular surgeon will say, go home, get well, come in really, really uh, fit, and then we'll do the surgery because they want to have good uh, surgical recovery rates also. So these look okay. They're enriched for what we think they should be. Now let's actually try to predict. So uh, it turns out if you predict using the topics, they are initially not that great. So the blue line is what you might normally use. These are just the incoming age, gender, and acuity score. And then if you use the, uh, and that gets worse and worse over time as you move forward in the ICU. That makes sense. It probably is less meaningful as you move forward in time, right? 
But when you look at the topics from the notes, so those are the red, those get more and more meaningful over time, which also makes sense because you're adding more text. And so they should be more meaningful. And when you use them together, you do strictly better them. That's great. So uh, this was a really cool project. And there's been a ton of follow-up in the eight years now since we published this paper. Um, and with, with really cool, more complex models. But one of the things that I think is, is a little bit frustrating is we haven't improved the AUC significantly so far. So uh, particularly if you use some of the deep learning paradigms, we aren't getting that much better at predicting mortality at these time points, right? And so just like in the previous work, I don't think complexity saves you, right? I think that there is probably some additional information or some insight into the model that needs to be done in order to make these jumps better, right? In order to improve our performance. And you can see, just like previously, we wanted to evaluate it on multiple tasks, so similar trends in other mortality prediction tasks. So for the last part of this talk, I'm going to focus on wearable outpatient devices. So there is a set of work I did at the end of my PhD with the uh, MGH Voice Center, where we were trying to predict whether a patient had different voice disorders in an ambulatory setting. We sent them home with an accelerometer, and then we looked at all of the data that they had recorded over the course of their stay at home and uh, tried to predict if they had different voice disorders. I'm not going to talk about that now, even though it's a very interesting set of work. Instead, I'm going to talk about uh, the Verily projects. So why would you want to do this outpatient monitoring? It's because life happens outside of the clinic. For most people, we are hoping they do not spend most of their time in a doctor's office. And so we need to be able to figure out what is going on with someone with these often very messy uh, signals that we can report from their home environment or their living environment. So digital phenotyping is something that you've heard from other people today. Um, I think it's uh, really impressive that you can take this kind of data and understand what's going on with a patient, how, know something more specific about them. Because if you've ever worked with ambulatory data, it's very messy. So the idea behind digital phenotyping is that we should be able to take these moment by moment quantifications of a person's behavior on these digital devices and then understand something about them or their condition or how we should treat them. And so for the work that we've been working on uh, right now in Verily, specifically with the baseline study and Project Myalo, we have active data. So these are surveys that uh, participants get on their phones. And we try to tie this to passive data. So spatial trajectories, physical mobility patterns, social networks, social dynamics, voice samples. So these are all things that are being recorded from the phone in a passive setting. And you try to tie them to the more active data. Because uh, one of the things that I actually uh, almost didn't believe until I saw it uh, for myself was if you sit in a doctor's office and a person has a voice disorder, for example, I would be speaking to them on the way to the doctor's office and they would sound a particular way. And we would sit in the step foot into the doctor's office, they would sit down and they sounded completely different. And I don't think that this is um, somebody putting something on, right, intentionally. I think behaviors tend to change when you realize that you're being observed or studied for that behavior. And so it's important to be able to tie this passive data to the more active measures. So uh, the kinds of technology that we are using for digital phenotyping are patient mobile apps. So we have all of these raw data sensors. And then we want to be able to use these raw data sensors to get at something higher level. So I want to be able to detect your sleep quality, your mood, um, your, your social patterns. And so we're going through several layers of filtering and machine learning to try to get there. So what could possibly play into phenotype or what are we thinking about right now? So it's things like how do depressed patients divide time between home and work? And these are all things that previous people have examined. What are the size and reciprocity of interaction networks in different kinds of uh, patients or non-depressed subjects? And can we detect mood or speech impairment based on passive mic samples? So uh, there has been some work that has found previous associations between voice and many things, but often these are in small sample sizes with active recording, right? So I ask you to say something into a microphone. I'm, I'm prompting you for it rather than with passive mic sensing. <laughs> 
Uh, so Project Myalo specifically, which is uh, the one I'm most excited about, is looking at cohorts of depressed patients um, who are self-reporting their PHQ-9 scores, and then we're trying to tie that to this passive sensing data. And so phone sensors, I think, are really cool because, especially within the mental health space, often there isn't a lot of reach. Uh, I, have a, I have a very good friend who's from Zimbabwe who works in mental health, and he told me that you know, the reason that he would be excited about something like this is because for the entire country, he thinks there are something like uh, two dozen psychiatrists. And so if you have limited resources, ideally you'd like to be able to target them at people who need them most. But mobile phones are ubiquitous now, and so if we can use them as some form of wearable monitoring, that's very powerful. So we're looking at tracking over time. Can we detect differences in mood, sleep, physical activity, cognitive function, social activities? And we're hoping that we can study this both at a population level, what is true in general for people from specific populations, and also at an individual level, what is true for me? when I am in a specific situation? And how do I maybe use that to inform treatment decisions, um, better engage with the patient, and then hopefully at some point uh, recruit people for GWAS studies? Um, so that's it. I am ending early, so you can ask uh, questions if you'd like. Uh, thank you for having me. We're taking a couple of questions. There. Hello, good talk. Uh, a quick question regarding the analysis of voice and maybe intonation, inflection, or uh, words people are saying. Uh, do you think uh, it would benefit from additional data? Because I, I believe a lot of cues are through the attitude, the way the person is moving, mm -hmm. like I'm moving while I'm talking right now. Yeah. And you try to capture that through video or something else. Got it. So uh, the question is, there has been a lot of work on voice uh, and trying to capture other higher level signals using voice, but would that benefit from extra signals? And the specific example is video, right? So if somebody's moving around. I think more data is always better, but I think we also have to be pragmatic about what we can realistically expect a user to give us. So in the voice work that we did before, we had to balance the data that we wanted with what we thought not just people who had the condition, but controls would be willing to give us, right? Because it's no good to find things that are consistently true in an entire population of people who have a voice disorder <coughs> if you're only studying them and you never study a person who does not have that disorder. Maybe it's just true for everybody. And so something like video, I think, would be very powerful. But I'm not sure about whether people would be willing to give that. And then also, as an additional signal, you have to try to understand how you would use that in conjunction with other things. Would it, would it be useful for studying depression specifically, or can we get enough information from where you're going using the accelerometer or the GPS to sort of account for that? So, isn't a large obstacle to having extensive data concerns about privacy, and in particular, how do you control or, or offer a contributor real control over f what uses you make of the data they provide? So uh, for the first set of data, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, that's uh, data that's in MIMIC, uh, which is freely available, it's been de-identified. And so everybody has to consent that their data can be used for research. And then there's a team of people who work between BI and MIT to ensure that the data is de-identified, the dates are shifted, uh, the notes are cleaned, anything that looks like it's too identifiable, like ages over 90, are just shifted. They get a random uh, date, uh, date of birth that is over 90. So there's a lot of effort that goes into curating and maintaining that data set, and people have already consented to be part of a research data set. For things like the voice data, that's a lot harder. And so, for example, even though I generally feel very strongly that once you're done with your uh, research question, you should publish data and have it be available for researchers, that was not part of that protocol because we didn't feel that we could de-identify it appropriately. Um, for things like uh, the Mayalo data, for example, right? you could imagine that scrubbed GPS 
or um, accelerometer information or call logs could be reasonably de-identified, right? But I think that it's on every uh, researcher, like being, being completely frank, anybody in this field is making concessions about a person's privacy and weighing it with what they think they can accomplish for the good of everybody, right? And so even though all those patients have consented for mimic, a truly malicious person might be able to identify one person out of there. They might be able to. And so I think that it's on us as researchers to be very careful with the data that we get and very thoughtful about the questions that we ask. I was more concerned about how the patient who owns the data can consent to the uses of the data. I mean, the mimic is unlimited use by anyone who wants to access that data. That's, that's a, a big give. Uh, your non-invasive or monitoring uh, of me personally, uh, might, I might be willing to agree to that if, you, if the data stops being used at you and doesn't go beyond, but how do I control that? How do I manage and, and assure that I understand where my data is going to go before I, and, and can, can get some valid, uh, verification that it stays within the constraints I expect? I think that it's, it is a hard question, right? So uh, it's a very hard question. I think that the field in general is moving towards trying to give patients slightly more modular control over their data. Currently, these tend to be opt-in or opt-out, right? It tends to be you're giving up your data. We don't know what future questions we might want to ask of it. And we don't want to ask you every time a future question comes up. And so it's opt in or opt out. I do think that there is a lot of opportunity to give people more modular control over what their data could be used to ask. I think that's especially um, important as we move into phenotyping questions, right? Where you're trying to identify maybe not one signal, one condition, see if there's a statistical association, but are there general behavioral trends or patterns that tend to lead to specific kinds of uh, phenotypes within specific diseases? So I, I do think it's important, but I'm not sure what the right answer is right now. And you're not aware of people I don't know of any studies. I, I think I have seen several studies that uh, are currently ongoing where individuals are allowed to consent specifically for a study, and then their samples are never allowed to be used for future questions. Those studies tend to be somewhat limited, and so often researchers don't uh, recruit very large numbers of people, as you, as you might imagine, right? So if you uh, recruit individuals, and then they say, you can use my data only for this very specific question, but never for future work, it becomes challenging to say, plan out future research in that vein. But I do think that there's a mixture and um, an interplay between the kind of data, how sensitive it is, and how much control you think a person would really want to have over that. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Please join me to thank Marcia for more time.